Anytime you're investing money into your home, you should be thinking about return on your investment. Where are the best places to put money into your home and get it back out? To hear that and more, stay tuned to this episode. The Den, powered by The Lions Group, a show dedicated to exploring hot topics in real estate, local happenings, and industry trends. We're a small team of professionals approaching 400 million in sales and nearly 2,000 local transactions. You're listening to time-tested experts and industry leaders. Here's a refreshing look at real estate happenings and more. Welcome to The Den. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Den, powered by The Lions Group. Uh, Today, we're going to be talking about remodeling ROI. If you're going to remodel and put money into your home, where should you do it? How much money would you expect to get back out? But before we do that, let me introduce my friends, my partners, my co-hosts, the fellow Lions Group. To my left, Paul, hand me the rock, Barry. Melissa, let's go, Glasgow. (laughs) Aspen, the ninja, Gruen, and Shannon, the boss, Martin Martinez. My name is Ben Lyons, and I'm your host of The Den. We are the Lions Group, top brokers taking on tough questions. So today, it's all about ROI. If you're going to put some money into your home, what should you spend your money on and why? Where are your best points to tip that needle in your favor. So Aston, why don't you kick us off as an owner yourself, and you've done a lot of properties over the years. What are your thoughts on some of the top areas where you should put your money into it if you're if you're an owner? So I'm very excited to start this one mainly because I think we need to address the elephant in the room that we all have nicknames. Yeah. <laughs> I've been thinking this since episode one. Okay. And whenever oh, he said goodness. I was going to start, I was like, oh, perfect. I know here. exactly what I'm going to say. <laughs> first things first, we need, I've been brainstorming. Oh. <laughs> I'm not creative like that. So I think we need recommendations uh, for my my nickname. Ben is it my nickname? Yep. How about Ben the butt dialer? <laughs> ben, yeah. the ben voicemail. Line. Ben, ben voice and Ben the voicemail lion. <laughs> that, I like that one. <laughs> so we're going to have to brainstorm uh, that. But as far as ROI goes, yes, I've done quite a few flips. Me and my husband like like to do them from my very first house was a flip um, and then just kind of branched off of there. Um, I think it kind of depends on what you're purchasing. Are you purchasing a complete gut remodel or is it just your, you know, family home that you're looking to sell now? Um, I think you need to get a realtor in to do a um, CMA, comparative market analysis, your home now, and then a home with some remodels and what the, those remodels are. So I was thinking... What are the things that are going to bring you the biggest return on investment generally? So my first one was cosmetic. People love the cosmetic updates. Um, they love they love to see see what their money's getting right when they walk in. So if you can if you don't have money to redo the whole home, I would say kitchen and living areas are going to be the biggest return on your investment. And when you say cosmetic updates, give us a little bit dive into that a little bit. Sure. So if you have you know builder grade cabinets that are maybe a little bit older. Maybe it make and it depends on your house too. So maybe it makes sense to just upgrade the fronts. Maybe it makes sense to paint the cabinets. Maybe it makes sense to redo the flooring, change to granite countertops or a stone countertop. It really depends on your house too. If you're if you're in a starter home, maybe it doesn't make sense to have, you know, granite countertops if someone's not going to be looking for that in that type of house. So that's why I think it's really important to talk to somebody mm-hmm. to see what is going to be the best thing for your house. Maybe upgrading the appliances to stainless steel. Um, I know people love to see that when they first walk in. If it's um, completely, you know, you're walking from one room to the next. I know some people really, most people, I think, really like the open floor plan. Um, So I would say those are kind of the biggest ones. Um, Flooring. If you have carpet in the bathrooms, people don't love to see that. That's a thing. It's a thing. That's a thing. That was a big thing. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, but my feet will be warm, right? You know what, fair enough. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And wet. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, it's terrible. So I think um, those cosmetic things um, are going to be the biggest return on your investment, especially because you can account for some of those things in your appraisal as well. So your appraiser is going to to ask about those things. And you said two things that are really interesting. I mean, I... I don't think it's, um, when you're talking about cosmetic, you're not in all instances talking about ripping cabinets out and all this. You're talking about painting and new hardware and some basic things, Mm -hmm. correct? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, If you have, like I said, if you want to do those stainless steel, that that looks nice and you can find relatively inexpensive ones. If you have really dark walls, um, paint to brighten it up. And I'm not talking, you know, hardwood flooring. You can get some nice, you know, laminate flooring or whatever it might be. 
um, to just make it a little bit more modern. People like to see what they're getting. But with that, if you know you need a new roof, get the new roof. If you know your electric maybe isn't quite up to code, do that. I know it's not Absolutely. fancy yeah. and flashy, mm -hmm. but it's going to come up. Anyway. It's going to come up. And if you've spent all your money on the cosmetic stuff, you might as well just put it into the substantial stuff. And then, you know, paint is relatively inexpensive. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you can paint yourself and maybe you leave the other things or maybe you offer an allowance of things. So I think if you know you're going to have big problems come up, maybe address those. But if you just have a few, you know, the roof's older, but it's fine and there's yeah. no leaks and... That's where allowances yeah. come into play. Mm -hmm. Well, and you also said something that was really important. I think the the uh, watcher, the the people that listen to this or are watching this episode should understand is that as realtors, we don't just do a deal and we walk away, right? If you call me and say, "Hey Ben, I'm thinking about selling in six months, um, but don't come over because I'm doing these things," I'm like, "No, oh, no, no, let me come over, right. mm -hmm. and I'll run the numbers for you, and I'll help prioritize that list." But let me run the numbers like what you said, Aspen, was now, and what will happen when you do these things? Yeah, and and realtors will do that if you're, especially if you're their uh, client, mm -hmm. they'll do that. That doesn't cost you anything as a client. Yeah, I would hate to see you put all of this work and time and money into something that I'm like, oh, but why did yeah. you do that? <laughs> you know, um, you spend tens of thousands on the landscaping, which might be great, and you have a really outdated kitchen or something. Like, sure, these things are important, but are yeah. they're not what most, we're talking about what most people are looking at. Yeah, yeah. great point, great yeah. point. Um, anything to add on that? Nope, that was that was that pretty was, much that, the gist. Okay, of that. I figured awesome. everyone will get a little bit. Yeah, better. yeah. <laughs> Shannon, what are your thoughts on um, the the hot spots you should be putting your money into if you're an owner, and where you're going to get the biggest return? So I think your biggest return is going to be. I, I agree with Aspen a lot. Uh, kitchens and baths, and I agree. Does it have to really be a complete remodel? Because that can be very expensive, mm -hmm. but you can get a lot of added value just by a fresh coat of paint new hardware, um, you know, maybe if you've got some old laminate countertops, even if you put in new laminate countertops, yeah. you know, they they look different and they give somebody a fresh look. So just freshening up the house um, with those things, you know, even if it's blinds, you know, some people, you, know, you see those people that have, their blinds are literally burned and scorched. Yeah, they're like uh, wilted. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. And, and they keep uh, on there, you know, yeah. um, you know, freshen those things up. That, that can go a long way. Um, you know, what you what you spend on those items, you're definitely going to get back. You're going to get back in, in your offer. Um, I think another thing that we overlook is just the um, curb appeal. And, and I'm not talking about necessarily doing tons of landscape mm -hmm. work. But, you know, when people come up to the door and it's their first impression, um, you know, if your front door is pretty ratty, put a coat of paint on it. If yeah. your front door, you know, maybe replace it if it needs to be replaced. If it's, you know, sticking or something, you know, maybe spruce up your patio area with a, a coat of paint on the top of the concrete if it doesn't look too good or put a little bit of furniture out there. I think those things you can do um, will bring a lot of value to how a buyer sees it. Mm -hmm. But I think... And like the hedges or, you know, if you have bushes outside and yes. they have not been trimmed in years. Yes. A buyer might automatically not even want to go in the house mm -hmm. because it's like, exactly. this is the house it looks like. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I thought yeah. you were going to talk about curb appeal because I had it as my number two, but I was like, I bet Shannon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She's, She's been beating that curb yeah. appeal drum. It's you true. You pull up to a house yeah. and people just say, uh -huh, no. Yeah. Or they've already decided before they go in that it's not the one because, you know, it doesn't have any grass in there. It's just dirt. You know, okay, well... Think about what it's going to take to throw some seed out there six months before you're planning on going to market and getting it watered really good. It doesn't have to be perfect. Yeah. But then now they pull up to something that looks like a home. It yeah. doesn't look mm -hmm. like, you know, a foreclosure. <laughs> yeah. That makes a big difference in someone's opinion. I there's a reason why there's the saying, judge a book by its cover. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason why people right. say that because that's a natural tendency for people to do. We do. Whether we want to admit it or not, we do. We we automatically look at the place and we know if we're going to live there or not, or that's just would even be a place that we would live. Yeah. I mean, that's how I buy wine. If it's not, <laughs> yeah. I'm not yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, if, it's, if the label is just flat, it's not there. <laughs> it's not there. I think the biggest thing that people overlook too is finishing attic and basement spaces. Um, if it's possible, it, it could add a little bit of square footage, which is good. But even if you even if you don't add the square footage, like even if it's maybe a small attic space and, you know, you're, it's not going to add that much because you can't count, you know, the corners that come down, whatever. Yeah, the tutored ceilings, yeah. There's, there's a lot of reasons for that. But appeal to a buyer, you know, now they see a movie room up there, you know. Now they see a man cave, if we can even say that. 
You know, they start seeing those things. Um, oh, we can say that on our podcast. Right. I just won't put it in print. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, or, or basement space, you yeah. know. I mean, even if you're just going to refinish it to make it a little bit nicer, even if it's for, you know, storage. Yeah, or the she shed. Right, exactly. Right, you have an old shed yes. that maybe yeah. just needs to be figured. You yeah. fix it up for, for that purpose as right. well. So. so we have these spaces that we're not even really, maybe you're using them, but you're not utilizing them as a selling point to the next person. So I think there's, and that's not going to cost you a ton of money in most cases um, to finish those spaces as to what you're going to get back with appeal to a buyer. Add some versatility and some value there. Excellent yeah. points. Paul, what are your thoughts? I just got a briefcase full of hundreds and I'm going <laughs> to dump it into my house. I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> we'll start there. Yeah. I'll be wrestling you in the front yard over it. And, yeah. I'll get in the briefcase in there. Yeah, yeah. When I thought of this, I mean, everybody said it already, kitchens and baths. Those are the easy ones. But I have another one that's cost almost no money. It's keeping your house clean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. if you keep it clean, don't let things deteriorate, fix the leak that happens, you know, keep things organized. When it comes time to sell, somebody's going to go in there, even if you have a... You know, what we would say is a builder grade or subpar or not, not flashy kitchen or bathroom or something like that. If it's clean, people overlook that. You know, I could live, I could, you know, cook in this kitchen. You can tell well-maintained houses versus when there's a lot of deferred maintenance. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And, and well-maintained. And, you know, I say sometimes, you know, the garage is your catch-all. But if your garage, you can't even look in there because there's so much stuff. Mm -hmm. That's not going to sell your house either. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is kind of prepping for selling, but just keeping your house clean over the duration of the time you're in the house could be your biggest return on investment when it comes time to sell. Yes. I'm glad you made that distinction because we are talking about return on investment and these, I mean, cleanliness plays into that mm -hmm. um, because there's a, you know, obviously if someone's thinking about these things and they're thinking about eventually selling the property. So, um, so all of these fa factor in, of course, prepping your selling is that episode we've already done, but the return on the investments there. So it's stay up. Maybe the more, the, the line is stay up on these things yeah. and the cleaning. So you're not having to go through and do it at the last. Yeah. Time. Because I mean, the, 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 the more you neglect the house, the more issues compound, mm -hmm. you know, and once you have a cluttered area, things behind there, you know, go wrong. So I think, you know, keeping up on your maintenance is probably your biggest return on investment too. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, if you have big issues with the house, yeah, that's something you have to address. But the the daily, the annual checkups, the, you know, the, the annual checkup is on your heaters, your, uh, your swamp cooler or your air conditioner, you know, making sure your appliances aren't way out of date, just Doing what you're supposed to do as a homeowner. Excellent point. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Yeah. Melissa, what are your thoughts there? I have two that I kind of want to talk about. One of them is kind of on the cleanliness side, whether it's you or a family member or somebody. If you smoke in your house, what do they say? It's like an automatic, well, like $10,000 loss. At least. Something like yeah, that. it's at least. So, you know, sometimes we, you know, we say, oh, don't worry about painting. Somebody's going to come in and make it their own. But if it stinks, you need to paint it. You need to clean it. You need to paint it and get rid of that that smoke smell. We see that still to this day, you know. And same with pets. Um, we become nose blind to our pets. But if your dog gets mad at you every time you leave and pees in that one corner, it stinks. And everybody so, else notices. And everybody else notices it. So that's one thing I would say is, you know, if that means that you are going to um, call the carpet cleaning company well, once a quarter to come out and clean your carpets, do that because it's going to you need that wow factor. You don't need somebody to come in and automatically smell smoke or yeah. pet. Or whatever. pet odor. Yeah. So that's one thing. When I say paint, it's for that kind of stuff. Sure. And then the other thing, and this is from my personal experience, and it goes with hand in hand with maintenance. I had an older home um, that had the original pipes under the house. Well, my sewer collapsed. So I got that replaced. I got uh, all, uh, actually all the pipes underneath the house eventually all got replaced while I had it. And I upgraded my water heater to a tankless. And those things were some of the things that the buyer that ultimately chose my home was the most excited about. So, yes, it was incredibly expensive, you know, because, oh, the joys of owning a house, right? Now I got to do this. But it's worth it because now you know that people are looking like, oh, they, my house or the house next door. Well, this one has all these updates. They're going to go for this one instead. Yes. Great point. I think... Um Buyers, especially nowadays, are a lot more educated yes. than even they were 10, 
and especially 20, 30 years ago. And although these investments into our home may not be sexy, as you said, at Aspen, they may not be the things that you really want to do, but replacing your old cast iron sewer line that's, you know, yeah, slightly leaking and maybe on the, the last leg um, may excite a buyer because they, they're coming in. They may be a first time home buyer. As our last episode, we talked about people buying to the top of their limit. They may not be able to afford uh, any any surprises and, and knowing that they have the comfort that, hey, my plumbing's been replaced or the sewer line's been replaced. That's a big deal. Maybe that's there's warranties deal. on it still. Yes. That's really nice. Transferable yeah. warranties. Yeah. Yep. And the windows. What are your thoughts on windows? Like, do you get, so at some point there's a tip, there's a tipping point, right? Um, and, and I have this conversation, but I want to get your thoughts on this. Buyers, or I'm sure, I'm sorry, sellers come to me and sometimes and say, hey, I'm thinking about replacing all of these windows and then we're going to go to market. And I'm going, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, do you know how much that costs? Yeah. Go get a, you know, get, go get a quote. And sometimes the quotes come back 20, 25 grand. Um, is it worth it to replace all your windows. If you had the old aluminum windows, maybe they're double pane. They're just not as pretty. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Shannon? Why don't you kick us off? Well, that? sometimes it makes sense. I would say if, you're, if your windows are sold, maybe they're the old crank windows and they're just not closing well anymore. The single pane. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah, it probably is worth it. And you may not get every penny you spend on them back, but you're going to get your house sold. Mm -hmm. the, the appeal to a buyer is just going to change with that. So I think that is very, very important in some cases. But like you said, if... They're just older, but they they don't leak. You know, the the gas between the panes aren't broken. They're they're not leaking. There's no issues there. Um, why would you spend that money unless a buyer brings it to your attention and says it's an issue for them? Because for most buyers, it's not going to. If it's intact and it's functioning, mm -hmm. they're going to be okay with it. Yeah, yeah. What about HVACs? So we get a lot of homes, especially here in northern New Mexico, southern Colorado, where they don't even have um, <laughs> cooling units in some areas. Um, a lot of people say, hey, Ben, if I upgrade this forced air furnace to a HVAC combo where they have forced air and refrigerated cooling all in one unit, um, how much is that going to make a difference in my value? What are your thoughts on that? Paul, do you have any thoughts on, on is that a smart move, especially if you're selling within the, the next year or... Let's just say you're a couple of years out. Well, I would say on the buyer's side, a lot of buyers will go into a house and say, well, I'll have to upgrade that to a split system. Um, and they factor that in and obviously the price comes down. Mm -hmm. So if you've already done it, that's a good, um, it's probably better for you, the home value. Um, if you're not going to enjoy it for very long, I would probably not make that upgrade. Let the, let the buyer come in and make that upgrade. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And sometimes I have that conversation with sellers like, look, if you're going to sell in like five years and you're going to enjoy this um, split unit or this HVAC combo for several years, because it's going to cost you $20,000 to do it, you're not going to get $20,000 value back out tomorrow if you do it. So, but there is an amount of money that you should say, I'm just, this is an enjoyment money right? This is the enjoyment factor. I, I want refrigerated cooling in my home uh, because how many times do we deal with sellers that are like, I got the house perfect and then we sold it, right? right. Like, so all these years they lived with like, you know, whatever they they had to deal with. And then right before they sell, they they put all this remodeling into it and then they sell it. It's Me like, oh, it's every house. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So expand on that a little bit. I mean, I if you're, if you're teetering, on an investment, but you, you know, you're going to sell sooner or you're going to sell later. Talk about so a couple of those scenarios. I mean, this is the first house we've moved in that we did not completely gut remodel. So it's a little bit um, different, but I lived with my stairs being unfinished for how long did we live there? Three, four years. And then a week before we were going to list it, we finished the stairs and it took us a few hours. I was like, why did we wait? Yeah. <laughs> so we just didn't want to do it. We just put it off. Um, I'm kind of with Shannon and Paul on this. If it doesn't always make sense to upgrade all the windows. It doesn't always make sense to add an HVAC or mini split system, especially if it's if an evaporative cooler is built for the house. They tend to work fine in this area. Mm -hmm. You don't always need it. It's right. not. But sometimes if you've added on and the back part of the house just doesn't get is just hot in the summer, it might be worth adding maybe a mini split system. Those are great options that I'm seeing everywhere now, especially like you said in Colorado, where a lot of the houses just didn't have air conditioning. It wasn't needed until, you know, the last 10, 15 years, really. So I think that's a great, more sometimes more affordable. Sometimes it can be huge cost, but it, it can be a nice option for people. I know 
in the tiny house I just got, that was the first thing we put in. There was no air conditioning in it. We added a mini split system for like $1,200. Yeah, very affordable. Yeah. And they're big. They're big in especially like Japan and the East Coast and these areas where they're, um, there's, there's big populations in small areas. And they have to go to something like that. Um, where we've been, we've been blessed with the luxury of, you know, having a little more elbow room in our lives. Um, I'm going to throw in a sleeper question here. I, I think we're going to skip the speed round today. I'm going to mix things up. Imagine that. <laughs> um, because my thought went to, I had this home last year and it really started me thinking about um, one component of investing, especially in a long-term play, right? You know you're going to be in a house for five years or seven years, or potentially even 10 years. But what should you be doing now to set yourself up? And I got to tell you, I had this little house on Lincoln Street and this house was, it was a nice little home. Hard, it was a Mossman home, hardwood floors, mm -hmm. built very well. Um, but nothing had been really updated in the home. It just had been cared for really well. But you walk outside and that landscape, it was like a little magic park. Like it was like a retreat. And I got to tell you, we had, I think, seven or 10 offers when we went to market on that. And then we had people calling for, I mean, weeks after it went under contract, put me on the list. I had a full list. And I think primarily because... Um, it really was uh, apples to apples. It was very similar to all the homes there. The difference was the landscaping. They really put a lot of thought into sun patterns and how to enjoy that yard space. What are your thoughts about that? And how important is it to have, I mean, how much of a swing in value or, or difference can it make with landscaping, especially in the backyard where you can, you know, especially here in this area, you can extend your living space for quite a bit of time. It's not like we live in, you know, uh, Canada where you've got, you know, three or four months that you can be outside and, and nothing against Canadian. I have some great Canadians, <laughs> friend, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's definitely different seasons here where we can enjoy our outdoor space quite a bit. What are your thoughts on that and the planning, the purposeful planning of your landscaping? Anyone want to take that on? Well, you know how I feel about it. I feel like it's very important. I always yeah. say that. Mm -hmm. The curb appeal when you come up. But the backyard living, in our house at least, you know, most summer we just leave our sliding door open. We're in, we're out. We eat most of our meals outside. Um, our backyard is just an extension of our in-store space. And we use it just as much. So for me, I think it's very important because we see ourselves living in it. I can't imagine buying a property where I walked out and it just had a dirt lot. Now, some people can and some people don't want that work. But I think the majority of people want to feel like they can live in it. And I think even if you're not putting a ton of money, you know, you don't have to go spend $20,000. But even if, like I said, plant some grass, if you know you're going to sell, you know, put a few shrubs in, you know, trim things up, make it look nice, make it a place that's welcoming, put some patio furniture out where people can see themselves actually out there enjoying it. Um, that's going to make a big difference. In, in an appraisal, it may not make much of a difference. Yeah. For, for an appraisal, you're, you know, you got landscape or you don't, and it's really not going to, but the value it's going to bring to a buyer and their appeal and their desire to buy it. Yes. It changes everything. Yeah. It changes everything. And I can attest to it, like Shannon's backyard, for those of you who haven't been there, is like a little park. It's like a little paradise. And you feel so comfortable. I mean, it's one of those that you're out there and you just want you want to sit down and have an iced tea um, and just hang out and enjoy the shade and just uh, have a good conversation. It's one of those. I know you're redoing your backyard now, Aspen. Have you any thoughts? About <laughs> yeah, no. And you never want to go <laughs> so backyard again, do you? <laughs> so me. I've been really lucky, Oliver. I, I agree with you. I also don't think everybody wants that, though, but I think if you see a well-maintained backyard, you know other things are well-maintained because if you have a yard, you know it is so much work. Mm -hmm. So I do think people say, see a nice yard, and they go, oh, this house was taken care of. You know, so I, I, I think that, but yeah, I, I moved into a house, and I say, we're not redoing anything as backyards ripped out right now. We It was beautifully landscaped, but it was all xeriscaped, and it was just so hot mm -hmm. so we have it all ripped out we're gonna do garden grass outdoor kitchen i'm really excited i've been trying to get it done for about a year now <laughs> but whenever it's done um we live in our backyard so yeah. i'm very very ready thoughtful and intentional about how you're going to yeah. use the space yep. and that's going to parlay out to most buyers looking at your home when you decide to sell down the road. And, and Melissa, I have to say your backyard's fantastic too. I mean, you've got that little pergola, you've got yeah. the she shed, um, you've got a wonderful little private area yeah. uh, to enjoy. I mean, how I important love, was that to you when you bought? 
Well, I went from one house being nothing but grass, which I loved, but uh, it gets a little stressful after a while, right? It's like, why isn't my grass growing? Yeah. <laughs> What's, going on with the grass? What's wrong with this spot? But I love a maintained yard. To me, it feels like home because mm -hmm. that's how I grew up with a beautiful backyard. So it's very important to me. It may not add, you know, money in my pocket, but I know it's going to be attractive to the next person who's also seeking out that retreat. So yeah, wonderful. Well, let's wrap this dis discussion up. I think it's been um, a great discussion. Paul, you want to add anything to the landscape component? I know you've got, you like to kill landscapes. Yeah. Is there, yeah. <laughs> my, my dogs tear it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about being grass. But <laughs> if, if, if you have a backyard and you're going to try to sell, make sure it's clean, mm -hmm. make sure that it's well kept when you go to market. Excellent point. Excellent point. Okay, on to my favorite part of the podcast, and that is the Lions Pride. As you all know, we are the Lions Group, and we do the best we can as realtors, individuals, and professionals to dedicate our time to making the community better, making our profession better, ourselves, the people around us. But we also like to reach out into the community and recognize those that do the same that aren't in the real estate industry. And so we'd like to highlight someone, Aspen. Take it away. Sure. So I wanted to um, highlight a event that just went on as well as some people that helped plan it. So um, it was the Four Corners Annual Martin Luther King Jr. Day of Service. So um, Liesl Dees, who's one of the leaders of um, Leadership San Juan, for those of you who are unfamiliar, um, helped put it on. But someone I really want to highlight. So I don't know if the listeners know this, but I used to own yoga studios and there was this young lady who I taught in the kids class. Her name was Savannah Robles. And she uh, took the class there and she's in San Juan College High School now. And she partnered up and helped plan this event. So basically it was a day where people could volunteer their time and service to put together trays for the hospital or volunteer around the community. And so they, them and their group put this on and in the spirit of volunteerism, they all went out and Served and, for the day. I love and that. what a great day to do it on Martin Luther King Day. Yeah. And so this is an annual event it's that they an have now. Event. And impressive for young people to do that. It I think is. that it gets lost on young people. Service mm -hmm. does yes. these days. Yeah, that, it, it really has. I mean, that's a great point, Shannon. So anytime we see something like that, what a great thing for the community. And Liesl's wonderful. Savannah, I, I don't know Savannah, but I'm sure you're fantastic. And just know both of you. Thank you for doing that, that we see you. We recognize what you're doing in our community. We want to commend you as the Lions Group. We want to welcome you to the Lions Pride. And what a fantastic, um, what a fantastic thing. Thank you for that, Aspen. Uh, if you are a listener and you want to hear us talk about a specific topic, I mean, there's thousands of topics in real estate. Please comment on some of these videos. You can also reach us at team at sjcbroker.com. You can go to our website and find out more about us, the Lions Group, and how we can give you an advantage in the market. We would love to work with you. You can schedule an appointment with any one of us to sit down and uh, have a consultation. Uh, you can also request our awesome buyer or seller guides, which are free. You can just reach out to us and we'll send you that and, um, and we can go from there. So we would love to work with you. We love the people that end up working with us and we develop great relationships. The Alliance Group is very proud of the work that we do. And we want to thank you for listening to today's episode. Next episode, we are going to talk about Investing 101. So that's going to be a fun one. If you're interested in investing, whether it's single family residential or commercial, long-term commercial tenants, we're going to talk about the spectrum there. So you want to stay tuned uh, to the next episode. And until then, we'll see you at the den. Thank you for listening to The Den, powered by the Lions Group. Hit the subscribe button to keep informed on real estate happenings. If you'd like to learn more about the Lions Group, visit SJC broker.com. Complex markets require complex strategies. The Lions Group can give you a true advantage in any market. Whether you're buying or selling, residential or commercial, contact us directly at sjcbroker.com. We're time-tested experts with a client-first approach, and we'll see you next time in the den.